Shall we give the Lord a clap offering, church? What a joy and a privilege to bring God's word into your homes. Now, wherever you're watching us from, I want to take a moment to thank the Lord for each of you. We thank God for you. We are praying for you. And I would like you to get in touch with us. If you have been journeying with us for a season, I would like to know how the Lord has blessed you through this ministry. So please do write to us. There are some numbers on the screen and there could be some email address on the screen. So do write and get in touch. I'm so excited to bring a word in season for you. As I was waiting upon the presence of the Lord, the Lord laid upon my heart to speak on personal revival. So today, I'm going to take a one-off sermon to talk about a prophetic word that's in my heart about personal revival, living in personal revival. For this, I want to take you to a text in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 to verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. Let's read it. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We ask that you give us listening ears and a heart that is willing to obey your word. Open our eyes to see what you are saying to us, mighty God. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace upon each of us. And I know that this morning there is a word that you are speaking to us to call us back to yourself. So give us grace to obey. We thank you. I ask that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher in Jesus' name and people of God said, Amen and amen. Praise God. You know, a wife walked into the house and said to her husband this, there is something wrong with the car. And the husband said, what's wrong? She said, I think there is water in the carburetor. Now the husband replied, that's silly. What do you know about cars? And even, you don't know even any, nothing about carburetor. Let me handle this. Where's the car, he asked. The wife said, it is in the swimming pool. I want you to listen to me carefully. The wife couldn't explain what was wrong, but she knows that something is wrong. This is what's going on in the world today. The whole world knows that something is not right, that something is wrong. They may not know how to explain it, but yet, they do recognize that something is amiss. So I ask myself this fundamental question, what is wrong? I want to give you three things for consideration. Adrian Rogers, a great man of God, when he was speaking about revival, he spoke about these three things. And I think it applies even today. I want you to consider this. Three things. One, anarchy in the world. Secondly, apostasy in the church. And thirdly, apathy among the faithful. I want you to think about this. Anarchy in the world. That means that, that the governments are failing. There is a lawlessness that prevails. There's a chaos. There's a confusion. There's a pandemonium. There's a mayhem. That's what that word means. The, word, the world is in turmoil. The world is in confusion. The world is in chaos. The world is in lockdown. There is so much that's going on in the world that you and I recognize that apart from the pandemic, apart from the terrorism, apart from the climate uh, crisis, all these things that you hear about in the news, there's other things that's going on behind the scenes. So there's anarchy in the world. The second one, there's apostasy in the church. In other words, the church ought to be light. The church ought to be the salt. 
The church ought to be a witness unto the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The church ought to live a separated life. Yet in the last days, the Bible says, people will have itching ears and they will fall away from the truth. In other words, they will, they will derail from the truth. They will shipwreck their faith. They will walk away from the faith. Many will even deny Christ as Lord over their lives. That's the apostasy that's happening in the church. But there is something even more subtle that you and I need to pay attention to, which is the apathy among the faithful. In other words, there's people who are in the church who may watch the services online, who may participate in small group discussions, but still live an apathetic life. That means there's no fire in their belly. There is no personal revival in their lives. They are just merely going through the motion, just going through a routine. I want you to listen to me. This is the reason why we need personal revival. Now, what is revival? Revival can be explained like this. Revival is when the community is saturated with God. When a community of believers, when a church is saturated with God's word, God's presence, God's tangible power. I tell you what, there is revival. I want to ask you this morning this fundamental question. How do we keep living in personal revival? This is where Apostle Paul gives us three keys to keep, keep the fire burning, to keep that revival fire. What are the three keys? Number one, it's living with an inward compass. It is verse 11 and verse 12. And then secondly, living with an inward cleansing. It's verse 12 and verse 13. Living with an inward character. It is verse 14. I want to touch on each of these one by one. Firstly, how do we keep ourselves, how do we keep ourselves in personal revival? How do we live in personal revival? How do we keep that fire burning? Live with an inward compass. That's the first one. Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 and verse 12a, this is what it says. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. I want to take a moment to just break down the, some of the key phrases here. Besides this, that's how the verse begins. What is besides this? What he talked about from chapter 12, verse 1. This is Apostle Paul writing to us from chapter 12, verse 1, all the way to chapter 13 and verse 10. Whatever he had written there, which is the practical, practical Christian living. You know, in up to chapter 11, he dealt with doctrine. And now he is dealing with practical Christian living. And here he says, besides this, so in chapter 12, verse 1 onwards, he speaks about being a living sacrifice. Secondly, he goes on to talk about from verse 3 in chapter 12, he goes on to talk about how do we serve the body of Christ? How do we do humble service in the body of Christ? Then in chapter 12, the later part, he talks about how love needs to be present in our midst and how we, with love we can overcome offenses and treat people with respect and honor. Then in chapter 13, he talks about submission to governing authorities. And then he brings again the element of love and he says, love fulfills the law. Now, these are the besides this. He has given you a background of how a Christian ought to live in community, how a Christian ought to live in the church, and how a Christian needs to have submission and humility and undergirded with love in our response to everything. Now, besides this, he says, the time, you know the time. The first thing he says about a believer is that the believer ought to know the time. There's two words he uses for time here. One is the time, and the other one is that the hour has come for you. Two words. We all know that in, in, there's a chronological time. Right now, if you look at your watch, there's a chronological time. That's the chronos in Greek. But there is a strategic time. There is a pertinent time. There is a most important time that we need to pay attention to. And that is the kairos time. It's the word kairos. Here the Bible uses the word kairos. He says, besides this, you know the time. 
In other words, this is not just like any regular hour. This is the final leg of the final lap of the final days of the world. Listen to me carefully. That's why he says kairos. That means we need to pay attention to the hour. This hour, it's not just the 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. This hour is that this is the last hour. And he says, the hour has come for you to wake up from your sleep. And then he goes, the night is far gone and the day is at hand. See, you and I, we know what he's talking about here, isn't it? As people of God, we are waiting for that day. Hallelujah. What is that day he's say, talking about? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2, that you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord. It's the day when the second coming of the Lord Jesus happens. And it will come like a thief in the night, the Bible says. Now, you and I have heard this for so long in the church world. Now, when I was growing up in India, in the 80s, they were talking about end times and they would talk about rapture quite often. But in the 90s and after the millennium uh, turn happened, as we entered into the 2000s, slowly the church world stopped speaking about end times and slowly the church world just moved away from that teaching. I want you to listen to me carefully. The reason why we sometimes don't talk about it is because we have been talking about it for so long and it hasn't happened. See, this is the question that the world even has. See, Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. They will say, who? The world will say, where is the promise of his coming? You keep saying that he's coming. For 2,000 years, the church has been saying that Jesus is coming. But where is he? Why is he not here? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. This is unbelief. This is how pre-believers, unbelievers, pre-believers or people with unbelief will speak. But believers ought to know that he is coming. In fact, he said in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7, Behold, I'm coming soon. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. In other words, you and I, we need to recognize that we are living in the last leg of the last days. And what he has predicted, as in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21, all these ap uh, apocalyptic chapters, whatever Jesus spoke about the end times, is happening right now. The birth pains have begun. So you and I, we recognize this. That's why for us, Paul writes and he says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed, he says in Romans chapter 13. See, you and I, we need to understand salvation is nearer today. You know, I, I got saved when I was eight years old, and now I'm in my 40s. I'm more nearer to the salvation than I was when I first believed. That's what Paul meant. See, you and I, we need to understand there are three tenses when it comes to salvation. There's a past tense, there's a present tense, and a future tense. In the past, we are saved from the penalty of sin. In the present, we are saved from the practice of sin. In the future, we will be saved from the presence of sin. In other words, our salvation is not yet fully completed. We have it, yet we don't have it in its fullness. In other words, at the moment, we are saved. We are justified by faith. And every single day, we are being sanctified for His glory. We are being set apart and made, made anew for his glory. But at the end, when he returns, we will be like him, the Bible says. In other words, that's where the glorification happens. So here Paul says that you and I, we are now closer to salvation than we were ever were. So pay attention. That is why he gives a very important call to the church. What is the call? The call to the church in this hour during pandemic and during lockdown all over the world is this. The church needs to be awakened. That's why he says in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, and, and he says to awake from sleep. Now is the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. The reason why this is so important is because we are so caught up with what's going on in the world. 
We are watching the numbers rise on coronavirus cases. We see how many people are dying around the world. We see what's going on. Will there be, will the borders be ever open? We hear all stories of how people are going through painful season in this, in this time. I want you to listen to me. You can be consumed by the present darkness and forget that you have a call of God to wake up and to maximize the opportunities he has given to us even in this present condition. That is why Paul writes to us and he says, the church ought to wake up, wake up from her slumber, wake up from her sleep. Why? Don't be caught up with what's going on in the world. When the darkness are covering the earth, the Lord's glory will shine upon it. The people of God will rise up and the light of the gospel will spread. This is the season, not for us to be locked down, but for the word of God to be unlocked and for the word of God to persevere. And for the word of God to be sown among the nations. Listen to me carefully. We got to wake up. That's what he's saying. And that's why there is a need for us to have an inward compass. And the need of the hour is that we got to understand the urgency that's happening in the world. You know, Psalmist says in Psalm 39 and verse 4 and verse 5, O Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Wow, what's he saying? He's saying that you and I, we need to recognize the brevity of life. You and I, we need to recognize how fragile life is. But in the, in, the, in the midst of this kind of fragility and the uncertainty and all that is going on in the world, the people of God who have the hope, the eternal hope of salvation, those who are waiting for the, eagerly for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they live differently. They are awakened. They wake up and they, they, they count each day for the eternal glory of God. They count each day, to, they want to maximize each day for the growth and the benefit of the glory of God and for the good of his kingdom. Listen to me carefully. They understand this. That's why the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul writes, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, because I'm awakened, I'm, I don't consider myself just as a citizen of Australia or a citizen of America or a citizen of India alone. I'm a citizen of heaven. That means my mandate is different. My mission is different. And therefore, I'm waiting for a savior to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 says this, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Jesus Christ, our savior. Hallelujah. In other words, you and I are not people with no hope in the midst of what's going on in the world. We are people with the blessed hope because we are waiting for our salvation, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ to come again in his glory and the time is at hand hallelujah that's why this is the application i want to give you take this down don't waste your life you and i we need to live with an inward compass a very clear compass in the midst of all the gloominess and the darkness and the confusion and the chaos and the pandemonium and the mayhem whatever that's going on in the world you and I, we have a clear sense of call and a clear sense of mission. And because we have called by the Lord and we have a blessed hope that he's coming again very soon and we recognize the times, that we recognize the hour, we don't want to waste our life. Rather, we want to invest our life. So wake up. Don't waste your life. I want you to listen to me carefully. You know, a study was done that in the Western world, whether you live in America, whether you live in Australia, doesn't matter. People on average spend five hours each day watching television. Now that television has been replaced by surfing on the internet, on your mobile phone or social media. But I want you to listen to me. Five hours each day is spent purely on trivial stuff. Stuff that's not going to help you develop or grow or do anything with your life. But I want you to listen to me. Just take the Christians among our midst. Just take the Christians in our church alone. 
take the thousand people and we take five hours each day. That's 5,000 hours each day. But if you calculate that for a whole year, my goodness, how much more hours can be spent that can be redeemed for the glory of God and for the good of his kingdom. Listen to me carefully. Even if we take redeem just one hour for every day, personal devotion, time of prayer, time of preparation before the Lord, going through the pages of scripture, studying and pouring our, pouring our soul before the Lord in prayer, all these things, it will allow us to grow and mature in the things of God. That's what the Bible is saying. That's what Paul is writing to us. Wake up. Don't waste your life. When I was a young man, I read this book, Why Revival Tarries. It gripped my heart. L Leonard Ravenhill, he gave six reasons why revival tarries. I want to give you this. Take it down. One. He says, evangelism is neglected. In other words, people don't really have a burden to go and reach their neighbor for Jesus. People don't really have a burden to share the gospel with people who they have an audience with. In other words, you don't recognize the divine opportunities God has placed around you. You don't wake up and recognize the divine appointments that he has for you. Why? Because if you're dull of your senses, you're just sleepy and you're walking around sleeping, you won't recognize these things. That's why he says, wake up. Evangelism is neglected. Secondly, the cheapening of God's grace. In other words, they take God's grace for granted. They know that they are saved, and so God will somehow be merciful and gracious to me. I'm fine. My, uh, my fire, I'm, I've got my fire insurance. Thirdly, he says, careless living. In other words, people live a compromised life. There is sin that is plaguing their life, carnality that is, that is plaguing their life. Fourthly, he says, fear that grips us. These are fears that, that they, they, are, they are real fears or they are, uh, they are fears that you have borrowed. Uh, there are fears that are, that are plaguing them, paralyzing them. Number five, lack of urgency in prayer. There's one thing that he says that, that is the reason why revival hasn't happened is because we haven't knelt down and prayed earnestly for the God of revival to come and visit us. Number five, Lack of urgency in prayer. Number six, steal God's glory for ourselves. That's why if you are part of an IDMC church, I want you to listen to me carefully. This is the season for us to truly do disciple making, to be authentic in our own discipleship and to be intentional in our disciple making. This is the season for us to develop that inward compass, to be very clear on the mandate of walking with God and the mission of working with God. This is a clear mission that God has given to us to be a disciple of a certain kind, as well as to raise disciples, to multiply disciple makers of a certain kind. In other words, I'm gonna ask you this humble question. Can you evaluate your own life and ask yourself, am I just, am I just being, um, looking at the circumstances and withdrawn and, and enter into an apathetic state, or am I on a personal fire? Is there a personal revival in my life? Am I excited about sharing the gospel with somebody? Am I excited about getting my family together to pray? Am I excited about reading the word of God together? Am I excited about, about reaching out to someone who is in a crisis or reaching out to someone who needs my help? Am I, am I helping in my small groups? Am I supporting them? Am I coming alongside of people of, in the household of faith? Am I giving and contributing and serving? Am I giving faithfully in my tithes and my offerings? All these things we gotta examine in our hearts. Why? Because we can slowly be withdrawn and we can be very apathetic. And that is what he says in the last days, you and I, we need to wake up and we need to walk in personal revival. So don't waste your life, invest it wisely. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian, once told this parable. He was talking about wild ducks that fly from north to south on migration. And one duck, when it was looking down, it saw a farm filled with ducks. So it came lower to see what was going on and realized that these farm ducks were taken good care by the farmer. He provided them water, he provided them food. 
So this one wild duck decided, I'm going to leave my family and I'm going to join this farm. I'm going to stay here for at least a week and enjoy this free food and free uh, drink. Now, after a week, it was so good that he continued on without realizing that he had stayed there the entire season. And one day he looked up. When he looked up, he saw his family migrating from the south to the north again. And suddenly he realized, I must join my family. So this time he tried to fly and go and join them, but he couldn't go past 10 feet. The reason is because he realized that he had become too heavy and too fat by eating all the corn. So he said, okay, I'll stay some more in this farm, but I'll try to lose some weight. Now this is what happened. By the end of that other season, he had no desire to fly again. He looked up, he saw his family moving from north to south, but he had lost the desire to be free, lost its desire to fly, to join them. Now this is the parable I want you to capture. Many of us are like that. We are the wild ducks that needs to be set free on mission, but yet we look at the world and the comfort and we seek and we become apathetic only to realize that one day these farm ducks are all going to end up in one Chinese restaurant and become Peking duck. I want you to listen to me carefully. You and I, we need to wake up. That's the call to the church. The second thing that Paul writes and he says here is to live with an inward cleansing. How do we keep living in personal revival? He says living with an inward cleansing. Romans chapter 13 and verse 12, the second part he says, so then, now, so then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. One of the things that you and I, we need to recognize is the need to live with an inward cleansing. There is an urgency to understand purity. Firstly, I said there is an urgency to, there is a need to understand urgency. Now here's a need to urgently understand purity. Why? Because Jesus is coming again soon and he's coming for his bride and his bride ought to be pure and holy, righteous and godly. Listen to me. That's why the call for the church is to cast off the works of darkness, the deeds done in darkness. In other words, the deeds done in secret. I like these two metaphors that Paul writes here. You know, firstly, he says, let us cast off, which is like remove your dirty clothes. In the morning when you wake up, after you woke up, you remove your dirty clothes and now you, you dress properly. The same thing he's saying, cast off. So firstly, he's saying, remove your dirty clothes. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul writes and he says to put off your old self. Every single day we acknowledge that we are people who are set apart. We are holy. We are distinct from the world. That's the reason why we are still here. We are not one among the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. There is a distinctiveness about us. And the Bible says you and I ought to put off our old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So one of the things he says is put off, cast off. The second metaphor he uses is, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Look at this in verse 13. He says, let us walk properly. Now, in other words, now it's a metaphor for walking. He says, it's a metaphor for behavior. He says, let us behave rightly. Another translation says, let us behave decently. In other words, you and I, we need to recognize as people of God, we are not only called to cast off the works of darkness, but we are called to put on and walk. Walk in a manner that pleases him. Walk in a manner that glorifies him. Walk in a manner that displays Christ and his glory to the world. Hallelujah. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says, As he has called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. In everything that you do, be holy. See, you are living among the world. The world is filled with narcissistic people. 
In other words, their, their, their center of gravity, their center of reference is themselves. Self is the center of gravity. Everything revolves around me. So in the midst of narcissistic society, you're called to be holy in your conduct. That means you're called to be Christ-centered, not self-centered, but Christ-centered, hallelujah. At the same time, not only they are narcissistic, they are also hedonistic. What does that mean, hedonistic? They're pleasure-seeking. You and I, we need to seek not the pleasure of this world, but the pleasure in God. That He is our satisfaction, our significance, our self-worth, our security. That He's the one who we want to please. Hallelujah. The Bible says, you be holy in all your conduct. Now, whenever, you, when, whenever Paul writes, he's a master teacher. He takes three pairs of two here. I want you to listen to me. There are three pairs that he puts together. In verse 13, he says, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. There are three pairs of sin that he puts together. Now, each one, it's a degree higher than the other. I want you to listen. Firstly, he says, not in orgies and drunkenness. What is it? In another translation, it says, not in caressing and drunkenness. Not in rioting and drunkenness. In other words, this is where not, not going into wild parties, where there's drunkenness. People lose control of their self. People lose control of their... Um, of their senses. As a result, they are indulging in sexual activities. So he says a believer ought to, not to be participating in these things. Now, he, you think about the Roman culture, how decadent they, the society was. And so that's what he keeps in mind. He says to the believers, you are not meant to be like that. They, they live in their orgies and their drunkenness, but that's not you because you are awakened. You are activated. You are somebody who is, who is waiting for the coming of the Lord and you know the time is at hand. So you don't waste your life. You invest your life. Now, there is a need for inward cleansing. You cleanse yourself from these things. Not only that, you walk in purity. So listen, he says, rioting and world. Secondly, he goes, sexual promiscuity and debauchery. In other words, you and I cannot be, there shouldn't be sexual immorality among the church. And but he's writing to the church. He's saying that in the last days, if you are not awakened, you will slip into these things. And now that sexual immorality and debauchery includes pornography, masturbation, having an emotional affair with somebody, phone sex, all these things are part of it. It's not just necessarily that you have to go and jump into a bed with somebody who is not your spouse. These things can now be done online. I want you to listen to me carefully. You and I, we need to have purity in our lives because he's coming again soon. He's coming for a bride that is pure and holy and godly. So how do we do that? We got to cast off the works of darkness, deeds done in secret. That's what it is. When no one is watching, how do you live your life? That one, we need to cast off those old deeds. And now he says, walk. You know, you have heard me say this earlier. There are three relationships with sin. One, some people fall into sin. We are all prone to it. We get tempted. Sometimes we succumb to the temptation and we fall into sin. But we quickly realize we have fallen into sin. We need to repent. We need to ask God for forgiveness. We need to be restored back into fellowship. We just come out of it. Yes, falling into sin. The second is caught in sin. These are people who are addicted to a certain things. Maybe addicted to pornography or addicted to having an emotional affair with somebody in their workplace or something like that. They are caught in sin. They, they are struggling. They want to come out, but they don't know how to come out. They are struggling. That's an addiction. The third one is living in sin. The living in sin is people who don't even have the desire. They are like that wild duck sitting in the farm one day to be cooked as a peking duck. In other words, they allow the sin to become a stronghold and they have no desire to even come out of it. The Bible says to you today, the day is coming, the day is almost here, so wake up and don't waste your life. But now, the second application is, don't hide your sins, clean up. Don't hide your sins, clean up. 
You and I, we need to clean up ourselves. How? Every single day, as you remove your old clothes, you're removing your old person, the old self. You're putting yourself to die on the cross and to take up the, the nature of God. You take up the Christ Jesus, the Bible says. Now here the Bible says, you need to deal thoroughly with sin because sin should not be found among us. What is the consequences of living in sin? I want, to, I want you to consider these things this morning. Number one, it hardens the heart. The more you de- live in sin, the more your heart becomes hardened. And when your heart is hardened, the Lord, the, you won't feel the presence of God. You won't feel the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You won't even feel your conscience uh, giving you uh, uh, directions. So what happens? You feel the burden, the weight of sin. See, this is what Psalm has said in Psalm 32 and verse 4. He says, For the day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. In other words, your hand was heavy. Why? Because the, he felt the sin, the weight of sin upon him. And the weight of sin brings the judgment of God that, 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 that the Lord is displeased. That whole weight was, he was carrying. He felt that burden. Secondly, it's the loss of joy. Many times when you are living in sin, you lose joy. That's why David cried out in Psalm 51 and verse 12. He says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Listen, you lose your joy when you're living in sin. Thirdly, you lose the power and zeal. You lose the power to live right and the zeal, the passion to live life. In other words, that's why psalmist cried out and he says, Lord, renew a right spirit. Create within me a new heart and renew a right spirit. Why? Because my spirit is now contaminated. I don't have the power to live life, the authority to exercise godly authority over things and, 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 and zeal to live for your glory. The fourth one is you would face divine judgment. When you continue to live in sin, you face the divine judgment. In other words, God will deal with sin. You know, we've been studying the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, he keeps saying that he will deal with sin thoroughly. So you and I cannot escape. So that's why you and I need to deal with sin now. Don't hide in your sins. Clean up. That's the application. Why? Because we need an inward cleansing. We not only need an inward compass for personal revival, we need an inward cleansing every single day for personal revival. You know, a story was told of a man who was brought before a judge. And this man was a well-off man, but yet he stole from a shop. So the judge said, you are well-to-do, you're educated. Why did you steal? And this man looked at the judge and said, judge, I'm a Christian, I, I didn't steal. It was my old self that stole. The new man did not steal, the old man stole. So the judge said, oh, I understand. So it was the old man's fault, okay. Then I sentenced the old man for 30 days in prison and the new man, another 30 days in prison for being an accomplice. I want you to listen to me carefully. You cannot escape. He will deal with sin. Now, I know that you would have heard this before. There's a quote about sin. Let me give it to you again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. It will take you further, it will keep you longer, and it will cost you dearer. In other words, Reputation is ruined, families are destroyed. It creates a mess. That's why when the time to repent, the time is now. Don't hide in your sins, clean up. In other words, let me give you some counsel as a pastor. Keep short accounts of sin. You and I do stumble and fall into sin, but quickly have that reckoning. Come back to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. He's faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Not only that, keep yourself accountable. If you're struggling with something in this season, even in this lockdown, when you have so much time in your hands and you have uh, no one to look into what you're doing, 
keep yourself accountable. You can be accountable with somebody in your life group. You can be accountable to your zone shepherds. You can be accountable to your pastors. I want you to keep yourself accountable so that you can grow in holiness. Thirdly, you seek counseling. If there's anything that you need to deal with, maybe it's time for you to seek a professional counseling. Now listen to this. There was an interesting sign hanging in a car repair shop. This is what the sign said. If you bring in your car before it breaks down so that we can service it, the rate is $30 an hour. If you wait until your car breaks down, then you bring it in, the rate is $50 an hour. If your car breaks down and you try to fix it yourself and fail, and then you bring it to us, the rate is $120 an hour. I like that. In other words, it's the same with our spiritual life. If we maintain our life, the purity in our life, the in investment in our life, that we have a clear compass, we have a clear mandate, we have a clear mission, we have a clear spiritual disciplines and a devotional life, what happens? We remain fruitful. But if we wait until we break down and then come to God, we will become barren. But if we break down and still try to find alternatives before coming, we burn out. Now listen carefully. You and I, we need to recognize how, when do you need to deal with it? Deal with your marriage crisis now. Deal with the sin in your marriage today. Deal with the sin in your life today. Get yourself right before God. So thirdly, the question is, how do we keep living in personal revival? Apostle Paul gives us the key. He says, living with an inward character. That's the third one. Verse 14, living with an inward character. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I would like you to pay attention to this uh, passage. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in verse 12, in the second part, he actually says, put on the armor of light. So you not only put on the armor of light, but now you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just like the metaphor of life, isn't it? When you wake up in the morning, you wake up, you remove your clothes, and you put on new clothes. Your dirty clothes are removed and you put on new clothes. The same thing he says, now you put on. What do you put on? Here he says, you put on the armor of light. What's the armor of light? The armor, meaning you and I know that in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about the armor of God. That as a believer, we need to recognize that we are in a spiritual warfare. Our warfare is not with people, but with principalities and powers of darkness. So therefore, you and I, we need to recognize that we are always need to be on guard. And that is why we need to have that inward character. There is a need for us to have that inward character. Why? Because the enemy cannot pinpoint something. You have not given room for the enemy to play havoc in your life. And we need that inward character. How? By putting on the armor of light. Light in the, word, the Bible, the light always refers to the word of God. That means you build the armor. You put on the armor with the word of God in your life. Not only that, then he goes on to say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this. He says, wear Jesus Christ. Wear the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives him the title and the, the, the name and the messi messianic title. The Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you rely on him as Lord. Lord means master. You rely on the master for direction every single day. You rely on him, Jesus, the savior. You rely on the savior for deliverance. You rely on Christ. Christ means Messiah. You rely on the Messiah to rule and reign and exercise dominion in and through your life. You put it on. That means every single day, you're coming back to God to say, Lord, I want to crucify the flesh along with all its desires, and I want to live for your glory. And as I live for your glory, I want to put on Christ. I want to put on the mind of Christ. I want to put on the compassion of Christ. I want to put on the, the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. I want to live the way Christ would live every single day. Now, this is putting on, and when you do that, the Bible says here, 
in, in make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. You know, I like how Paul writes. Paul always talks about a positive and a negative. He gives you a negative. Cast out, you know, let us cast off the, the deeds of darkness. And then he says, put on the armor of light. One negative, one positive. Then he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. And then not in orgies. Then he gives you three things about what you shouldn't be doing. And then here he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, but make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I love the way he always speaks about both the positive and the negative. In other words, Christianity is not about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because if you just have don't, 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 you can add a lot more don'ts and it will become legalistic. But Christianity is about yes, yes, yes. But if you, Christianity is all about yes, yes, and yes, it can become license. In other words, people will say, oh, there is no boundaries. But I want you to think about how it is. He puts both yes and no. He puts both the positive and the negative because there is a boundaries in how you live your life. That's why it's a character. We have to develop in that character. That character is maturity. Here he says very specifically, do not make provision. In other words, don't allow for flesh to dominate your life. See, if you keep allowing the flesh to dominate your life and flesh to gratify your desires, you know what you are? You are immature and a child. But he's saying, don't be childish, grow up. In other words, don't gratify your flesh, grow up. That's the application. Don't be childish, grow up. Don't gratify your flesh, grow up. Why? Because when you grow up, you can take authority. You can, you can live with that inward character. Now, what is this character? This character is the one that displays to the world how you are becoming more and more like Christ. The more you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are being transformed. Revival is not about just a change in an outward behavior. Revival is about a change in the inward condition of your heart. In other words, the heart is now being transformed from the inside out. The heart is now being changed and molded and shaped to be like Jesus. And that is what he means to put on Christ. And not only to put on Christ, but the more you continue to walk in Christ, the more you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You will not make any provision for it, but rather you walk in righteousness. Now, in closing, let me say this. What is righteousness? Righteousness is this church. That you think right. You speak right. You do right. Can I humbly say this? In the last days, you and I, we need to live right. That means there is a righteousness about our life. We are inwardly, we are right. Outwardly, we are right. We are upright, we are downright, we are in right, and we are outright. We are right all around. That rightness, that righteousness is, should be our character. And that is what Paul says in the last days, you and I, we need to come back to. So there are three keys he gives us. And I want to summarize these three keys once again and give you this practical application. The first thing for personal revival is, there must be an inward compass. Don't waste your life, wake up. Secondly, there must be inward cleansing. That inward cleansing means don't hide in your sins, clean up. Thirdly, there must be an inward character, the maturity to become more and more like Christ. So in other words, don't gratify your flesh, grow up. Can I humbly say this? You have 168 hours in a week. I want you to consider one thing. Tithe your time unto the Lord. What does tithing the time means? You know, we tithe our resources. Time is a resource. You have 168 hours. If you tithe one-tenth of your 168 hours is 16.8 hours, which is two hours and 44 minutes in a day. If you can take two hours and 44 minutes each day, 
and you say, Lord, for two hours and 44 minutes each day, I want to do your kingdom work. I want to spend time in prayer. I want to study the word. I want to share the gospel with somebody. I want to do life with some believers. I want to spend it for eternal things. See, we are living in the last leg of the last days. Don't waste your life. Wake up. Spend your time on things that matter in eternity. The souls of men, the word of God, and coming together and praying before the Lord. You know, one of the things that I'm burdened with in these days is to spend more time in prayer. I'm a man who prays and a man who studies the word. But the burden I sense in my spirit in this season is to pray and be in the presence of God more and more. Why? Because the days are evil. The days are trying. The days are bad. So when you, when, when you are surrounded by this gloom and darkness, people of God should be awakened. People of God should wake up and not waste their life, but invest it wisely. They should, they should not just hide in their sins. They should clean up and develop that inward cleansing and purity. They should not just be, not just be uh, gratifying the desires of the flesh, but rather they should develop an inward, inward character to become more and more like Christ. And the way you can become more and more like Christ is only when you spend time with Christ. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says, they had been with Jesus. The people recognized that Peter, James, and John had been with Jesus. In other words, they had been with Jesus until the aroma of Jesus was on their life. The power of Jesus, the presence of Jesus was with them. They're being transformed. Hallelujah. I want you to listen to me. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You and I, we need to grow up. How? In the knowledge of Jesus Christ. How can you grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Unless you study the word. So can I humbly encourage you, church? Study the word together in your small groups. Study the word together in your family. Set apart a time to pray together as a family. Come together in your small groups and pray. Pray earnestly for the Lord to move, the Lord to move in the world, for the Lord to move in His kingdom, for the Lord to move strongly in the church, and for the Lord to move among our next generation. That He will awaken all the apathetic believers. That He will awaken the church to rise up and to walk into her destiny. That we will be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this moment. Lord, I thank you for your word. Even now, mighty God, I come before you in repentance. Church, would you take this moment? I'm not sure where you're watching this from, but there is room for us to come back to God, to repent. All of us need to come back to God because in one way or another, we either are walking, sleepwalking, or we are living in sin, or we are in a place where we haven't allowed the Spirit of God to continue to transform us into the likeness of Christ. Today, we want to come back to Him. Would you take this opportunity to repent? Would you take this opportunity to say, Lord, I want to change my ways. I want to commit my life to You. Would you take this opportunity to say, Lord, I want to be awakened. I don't want to be, I don't want to be sleepwalking. I don't want to be caught up in the system of this world. I want to be awakened. I want to be activated for Your kingdom. Church, if you're dealing with some sexual sin, now's the time to repent. If you're dealing with, if you're dealing with some condition, a sickness or an illness in your soul, an addiction, a stronghold of sin, now is the time for you to deal with it decisively. Come before God. He's faithful. He's just. He will forgive you. But He's calling you to repent. Oh, every head bow, every eye closed all across this place. Father, I pray for every boy, every girl, every man, every woman under the sound of my voice. I pray, Father God, that you would continue to deal in their heart today. Today is the day of repentance. Today the Lord is calling them. 
I pray that they will not harden their heart, but rather they will soften and there will be a breakthrough in their heart. That they will come and yield and submit themselves to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for deliverance. Deliverance from the evil one. Deliverance from the, that addiction, that bondage. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you, we praise you. Lord, I pray for every person, every husband, that they will rise up and take leadership in the family. I pray for every wife, they will rise up and take leadership in the family, that there will be a, a, a spiritual atmosphere that, that will be present to minister to the children. They will prioritize reading of scripture and prayer, and they will prioritize as a family discipleship, mighty God. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that in this season of lockdown that we will not be apathetic, but we will continue to rise up and do life together in our small groups. We will reach out to people in our neighborhood. We will take the opportunities that you have given to us to reach the unreached. Lord, we pray that you give us that grace as we see the day approaching, as we recognize that the Lord is coming again very soon, that Lord, that we will be wise to invest our time in eternal things. We give you all the glory, the praise and the honor. I pray that you continue to protect your church, continue to preserve your church, continue to lead us into personal revival and lead us into a place where as a community, we are saturated with God. We're saturated with his word. We're saturated with his presence and with his power. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen and amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you shalom. Go in his peace, church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We are here for you. There is a number on the screen. There's an email address on the screen. I would like to hear from you. Do write to us. If there's something that you want us to pray for, we're here to pray with you. There's a prayer team that will pray with you. And so do write to us. If it is confidential, do write and put confidential so it will come to me. So I'll keep you in prayer. This is something that we are here for you. I want you to know this. You're not alone. There's a whole community of believers who are with you. God bless you. We love you. Have a blessed week ahead.